Thank you very much. Good afternoon. This panel made up by people of, with a long track record in climate change and agriculture-related emissions is a hot topic nowadays and a big challenge for the near future. In, next, in the near future, there are two challenges which look like conflicting goals. One of them is to produce more food to feed the world and meeting the and meeting the challenges of food security, and we know that we live in a world where there are serious issues related to food scarcity in some regions where population is growing fast. Uh, the, these populations don't have a chance of buying enough food. We know that in order to produce 1,000 more tons of grain, we will have to work hard. And the second goal, is, or the second issue, is that in order to produce food, we have to do it in a sustainable way, in an environmentally friendly and positive and efficient fashion. So we have to work. We have to produce food with higher environmental efficiency, reducing emissions. This, both issues seem to be in conflict with one another nowadays. Apparently, we are moving along a path where we should choose between defending climate change or food security. This is what it looks like. But in this panel, we're going to talk about how non-till may be the bridge between both challenges, both international challenges, so that we may offer the world food security plus environmental security. So first of all, we'll give the floor to Shuao and we'll analyze whether it's true that non-till may help to mitigate climate change. Lucia will talk about the issues in Uruguay, comparing non-till with conventional agriculture. And finally, Ernesto, who is a good friend of mine, and we'll talk about new ways of looking at the world, a world where, where calculation methodologies are not the ones that were developed in the region, but in the region we have a lot of information and results on how we produce emissions or how we may be polluting the environment. And from because the analysis is usually made by site and think tanks which are not in our region from areas, they are from areas that have a tough time competing with our region. So no, Ernesto will explain to us how we may turn into a producing area, producing region that produces in a sustainable fashion to meet the challenges of food security and environmental security. After the presentation, I will wrap up, and if there is time, there will be a Q&A session. So first, I'd like to invite Joel to take the floor to tell us when, how, and where could non-till help us to meet these challenges. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizing committee, the APRECID, and the Brazilian O2 Federation for the opportunity to be here to talk about the potential and the challenge of the world conservation agriculture to mitigate climate change and food security. Our presentation was composed based on six topics. The overview of the current global carbon cycle, when that is related to the rationale of conservation agriculture to mitigate climate change, where limitations and potentials related to, to climate and soils, and how process leading to carbon accumulation under conservation agriculture, food increase, intensify production system to increase crop productivity, and finally the conclusion. 
So, first of all, I'd like to present uh, the global scenario about land use. We have around 13 billion hectares and the land on earth. The total cropland and pasture land group 38%. The forest land around 32 and the urban and the unsuitable land around 30%. We are talking about 1.43 billion hectares that cause everything that we are seeing in the world. So, the global carbon cycle and the current stage is composed by two main carbon emitting compartments. First one is the fossil fuels, combustion, cement production, and human activity that responds by 9.9 billion tons per year emissions. The second one, the land use and the land use change, including deforestation, respond by 1.3 billion tons per year. Also, we have a sink compartment composed by land that respond by 1.9 billion cup that removers every year from the atmosphere and the ocean that comprises 3 billion tons per year removed from the atmosphere. However, we have a, a missing carbon that accumulates every year in the atmosphere that we call it growth atmosphere and respond by 6.3 billion tons per year accumulated in the atmosphere. So, the cumulative CO2 emissions between 1870 until 2016 is around uh, of, of, of there, around 560 billion tons and comprised by fossil fuel emission emitted 412 billion tons and the land use change emitted the total 148 billion tons. Okay, based on this scenario, we have to show the global soil carbon budget that today we have around storage as a SLC in the soil at one meter depth around 1,550 billion tons at one meter depth. But it's important we know the historical carbon loss but land use change. Why this is important? Because all calculations we are trying to, uh, to achieve these this numbers. Uh, this started when we converted native vegetation to agricultural land. And during this stage, soil cultivation responded by 78 billion tons of emissions where erosion responsible by 26 and the mineralization of the soil plow uh, around 52. And the losses of deforestation around 67 billion tons. So, the historical soil carbon loss com compared to the world soil carbon stock at one meter depth represent only 9.4%. So, now we have some estimation that was made for some people that uh, relates the current global potential of agricultural system toward to offsetting greenhouse gas emissions around 0 0.3 to 1.17. It means that this uh, contribution can in part contribute to reduce, to decrease the land use change emissions. But it's important we know that a huge discussion about this issue. And the debatable issues include the effectiveness of no-till to mitigate emissions and the feasibility of upscale, the regional scale. What it means? If we know, looking for the literature, some important groups of research state something about no-till and concern if it works or not. For example, Peter Cohn published in Nature in 2014 that no till reduces yield, yet this response is variable and under certain conditions no till can produce equivalent or greater yields than conventional tillage. Also they said 
no two in combination with the two other principles of conservation agriculture significantly increase rain-fed crop productivity in dry climate, suggesting that it may become an important climate change adaptation strategy for drier regions of the world. Also, Paulson and another research group in the Nature of Climate Change reported that no two is beneficial for soil quality and adaptation of agriculture to climate change, but its role in mitigation is widely overstated. Also, they, they did a question. So what is the evidence that soil organic carbon stocks increase substantially under no till and can be viewed as a carbon sequestration and hence contribution to climate change mitigation? To finally, this, this statement, Van der Beiger said, let us be realistic about no-till. Recent estimates claim that less than 10% of American farmers are considered continuous no-till practitioners. And also they said, indeed, 1994 to 1999, continuous no-till period in Illinois and Indiana was less than 2.4 years and 1.4 years. So, we try uh, to group the main topics that can explain these uncertainties about uh, the credible no-till contribution. Okay, let's go ahead. First of all, one of the big discussions is the capacity of soil carbon sink is finite. It means the recent re research says between 50 to 85 years we can achieve the top, the saturation point of carbon. After that, no more sequestration. We have a finite limitation. Second one, diverse crop sequence or combination with worldwide adoption of no-till promote variable effects on the crop yields at global scale. The third one, difficult to obtain credible estimates of soil carbon on landscape scale that require a complex framework by the range of climate, soils, crop, crop and seed, which exacerbate uncertainties about carbon sequestration. The four, high risks of re-emissions of soil carbon sequestered to the atmosphere because if we do uh, even single tillage event, we can negate the previous carbon sequestration. The fifth is high variation and uncertainties of the carbon sequestration ra rates in fields under involving the three pillars of no-till. And finally, low amount of biomass carbon return to extreme weather events such as long dry period or excessive rainfall. So, based on this discussion and concern, we try to ask which are the scenarios for no to act as a climate change mitigation. Let's try to explain a little bit more. First of all, the publication from Pete Elcon in 2014 in Nature in 2015 and Field Crop Research reports yields, impacts of no till relative to conventional tillage in tropical, subtropical, and temperate latitudes. They concluded that in tropical, subtropical, and temperate, negative effects is overall. The first number, the left, ref, uh, refers the number to, of observation. And uh, the, the second number refer the number of uh, experiments. So, when they compared yield in no till versus conventional uh, tillage in relation to the other two principles of conservation agriculture, including double R and CR, that means residue retention, residue retention or re, re, uh, crop residues, the CR, they concluded that in general, independent of the climate, independent of the soil, 
the effect was negative. But when they compared, tried to split dry climate, humid climate, and the contribution with the rotation, the scenario changed. And they conclude that in dry climate, in dry climate, you can sequester, you can have uh, yields greater in no-till than conventional. This is a good news, and exactly in, di in this point that we would like to discuss. Because we add our, this database, an interpretation. Starting from the carbon balance. The carbon balance is very simple. It means when the biomass carbon input is less or lower than the carbon output, soil can work as a source of CO2 emission. When the biomass carbon is greater than the carbon output, in this case, we can accumulate carbon and soil can be a CO2 sink accumulation. Based on this, we try to use the, the 4,000 papers, the 4,000 information, adding more 250 information about carbon with this group, and we separate by the pillars. When we use only no plow with only one pillar, independent of the climate zone, the carbon balance is negative. It's not a problem of no till. It's a problem of the system. When we include the second pillar, that means permanent cover crops and no plow, the scenario changes a little bit, but it's still negative. Only in temperate zone is closer to zero balance. But in subtropical and a tropical is still negative. So when we include the three pillars, and add more biomass than the carbon output, we have a positive balance. This, uh, it just converge. It's, uh, you know, they link it with uh, the Piltelcom information. And this is very important because exactly that we are looking for. But in tropical areas, you can see the variation is so high. That means the production system can be adapted in different environments and affected by temperature and uh, soil moisture. Well, why I'm talking about it? Because we need a minimum amount of biomass input for carbon balance. Why? Look this example that we published for the Mato Grosso in, uh, in uh, the center zone of Brazil that the x axis represents the zero balance. And the point that was emphasized but the red circle means uh, oops means the minimum amount for zero balance. Here we have around five point three to six tons of carbon to put the balance zero. No sequestration, only establish the zero point. And after that, we can say that the soil will have a positive balance when the biomass carbon input is greater than the minimum biomass carbon input for zero balance. So, this range can see the positive balance. This is the no-till that we are looking for. And why? Because when we have the three pillars and we have a carbon sequestration increases soil quality, what said David Paulson, we have a, a, a linear correlation with the yields. Look at that. We increase carbon by increased biomass. We are increasing yields for each one ton that we increase, we can produce 28 kilos more of soybeans. It's a, you know, it's like a homework that we need to do. Uh, to the, 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 the last topic we selected, but in the papers, 
uh, the rates of uh, carbon sequestration for each continent. And we can say the average is the most common point that the carbon is a zero or a little bit higher. The intermediate, the intermediate rate, the intermediate rate, it means 161 or 2.3, whatever, for the other continents, sounds the uh, some carbon sequestration rates achieved in crop seeds with a high amount of biomass input. Okay, based on this, we try to select, for example, current we have around 155 million hectares under no tills, the, the number, but some one said is around 175, but I calculate for 155. We have around 0 0.14 to 0 0.47 billion ton per year. This is a current emissions by land use change. If we, and this amount represents around 10.8 to 35.4 percent to contribute to decrease the emissions. If we increase, if we increase uh, um, the land use with no-till to 16.4 percent of the total world land use, we have around 0 0.21 to 70, and represents around 16 to 53.9 percent of the current land use change and our emissions. We can decrease, we can negate. And finally, if we extend for almost 26 percent of the world land use based on the three pillars, the potential of no-till to mitigate can negate the land use change. That means it's possible, but we need to change our mind, that we need to change our strategy, that we need to change our focus and input more diversity and carbon input. So, the food increase? Yes, we can increase the food. Looking at this uh, estimation that we published in 2017 in this magazine, this journal, and we say that soya be only cereal include wheat, corn, and soya beans, we can increase it during 17 to 50, 340 million tons of uh, extra production, but with no two based in the three pillars. We also can in, uh, produce around 17.6 per year, 2.2 million tons per year. So, what we can conclude? The no two adoption through the three pillars and based on the carbon sequestration rates above carbon balance is the pathway to offset carbon emissions due land use change. When no-till based on the three pillars reach 36 to 30 percent of the total land use change, we will neutralize the effect of land use. So, no-till is very effective, but we need it to practice, to adopt the high quality of system. Without this, forget it. Thank you. Thank you, Joao Carlos, for your presentation. And now, Lucia Salvo Álvarez. Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon. Thank you to the organizing committee. Aprecid, Aucid. My topic today in this panel is a comparison, a very specific comparison in Uruguay 
and I'm going to compare based on the little uh, amount of time that I have how much carbon, how much gas between no tillage and conventional tillage. First of all, we have to understand that to estimate a global warming potential of a management system, we have to consider the CO2 balance, the night, the night into the oxide, nitrous oxide emissions, and we have to consider each component. Nitrous oxide is very important because it has a global warming potential which is much higher than CO2. So it is very significant in the gas balances in the different management systems. Now, how do we calculate the global warming potential? It is the variations of carbon, CO2, that are considered based on carbon balances, how much we had in the beginning and after a certain amount of year, how much we have, or to check whether we've lost carbon and we are emitting CO2, which contributes to global warming. We have to add nitrous oxide, which is three times more important, and this is linked to fertilization and fertilization. Then we have methane that uh, is times 25, so uh, agricultural system oxidized methane, but this is not very important in gas balances. And then we add CO2 costs, which is different application rates, herbicides, fuel, tools, that everything is uh, converted to CO2 equivalent. So what about uh, soil organic carbon under no-till when you, we compare that to conventional tillage? We've seen that no-till increases carbon stocks or keeps them at the same level compared to conventional tillage. So here we have information about the U.S., Canada, Argentina, tropical and subtropical Brazil that go from zero to almost one ton of carbon in subtropical Brazil. But this is the range. There may not be carbon sequestration or you may sequester a certain amount. What about Uruguay? This is a long-term experiment in the west area on a typical argidol. This has been going on for 20 years. At 10 years, we checked carbon content, and this experiment is showing a slope from 0.1%. So erosion has led to little losses, and this, of course, affects carbon losses in the system. And in Uruguay, based on estimates on certain models, from 50 to 90 percent of carbon losses in continuous agriculture are due to erosion. So erosion results in big carbon losses. This experiment shows a comparison between the systems, the two first bars, continuous conventional till and pastures, three years. So agriculture, three years, pastures. The other two bars is the same sequence, which is wheat, soybean, or wheat, barley in winter, soybean, sunflower in the summer. And we have the same sequences in under no-till under C3. And after 10 years, no significant differences were, this, were um, found. 
because erosion here is not important due to the slope. If this is a 3% slope, which is the usual thing in Uruguay, most probably treatments have been showing different results. And though the differences were not significant, we still see some magnitude increase and it does increase a little bit more in sequences that added C4 in the rotation as summer crop. So the summer crop included sorghum or corn in the past three, four years. And in that period of time, they increased carbon amounts. So, carbon sequestration, as I have already said, depends on several factors on the carbon baseline, on the agricultural system, and also on the rotation sequence. So it's a balance of inputs, and that was the more biomass, the more carbon in the system. So it's sometimes not as easy, as I said, to estimate how much carbon is captured regarding nitrous oxide, if we compare different agricultural system and emissions, there is uncertainty. Some papers show that non-till produces more than conventional tillage. Some others say just the opposite, and some others say that the emissions are, like, are alike in the both systems. Which are the results of Uruguay for the time being, for th of th the results of three years of yearly analysis? We compare the three, uh, sorry, the two system, non-till and traditional cropping systems. And in the three years where we made measures measuring nitrous oxide emissions, in two years, conventional tillage produced more emissions than non-till. And thus, in average, Traditional agricultural methods produce 18% more of nitrous oxide than non-till systems. So you see here nitrogen, 3.3 kilograms of emissions of nitrogen, and 2.8 in the case of non-till. This is nitrogen loss of the crops, which is not a lot, but if we multiply this times the 300 300 degrees, the global warming potential, well, has a big influence on gas balances. Here we see the rotation is wheat, soya bean, and uh, well, the figures are average. We have an average of wheat, soya bean, continuous crops, and three years soya bean, soya bean, soya bean, and three years of perennial grasslands. Of course, all the figures and the results and the emissions vary from year to year. Here we only have information for three years. So we need more historical information to be certain that the average is giving us the right information. So the more information we have, the better, the more accurate the results. The other methane usually non-till system or uh, agricultural system in dry land conditions produce methane oxidation and in non-till there is more oxidation, more CO2 oxidation. That would mean uh, sequestration of methane from the atmosphere because the microorganisms that are involved in grow, the number of organisms grows when we have fewer disturbances. Here we have results of two years of measuring methane. The first year we only measured N2O. So here we are comparing con continuous crops and a rotation between crops and grasslands. And we see that in neither of the two systems there is more oxid oxidation of more than one kilogram of carbon as methane and the conventional tillage, there is more oxidation than in the non-till system. Finally, we have all the components and we may calculate 
uh, gas balance, which has to include all the components N2O, CO2, CH4, and the CO2 costs. I have two examples here of the sequences of continuous crops because if you have crops and pastures, it, the measurements are tougher because you have livestock too. But these are the results of the two year, the, ten, the last 10 years, sorry, here. And there were more, there was more carbon sequestration. In the case of traditional systems, there was a loss of 591 tons of carbon. And in the non-till with continuous crops, the figures are different. What we have as a, as a minus on that table is the carbon removed from the atmosphere. Everything else is production of carbon going into the atmosphere. Uh, you can see how high the nitrous oxide emissions are. And it's very difficult to offset them with CO2 capture or CO2 sequestration. The biggest losses are accounted for by the nitrous oxide and the CO2 costs, which are lower, CO2 emissions, which are lower in the case of non-till approaches. When we draw the balance, we see that the conventional tillage, there are twice as many emissions of greenhouse gases than under the non-till system. And, but all sequences are not alike. When we change a sequence, when we go to continuous crops with non-till, well, the emissions are different. Why? Because the coal we use uses a nitrogen-based fertilizer and because there are more costs related to it. In our case, and in this test, the yields in the non-till system increased vis-a-vis -vis conventional tillage. After 14 years, in the first years, the yield was lower, but this is because we were not very familiar with non-till yet. But after that, there was an increase in the yield, both for summer and winter crops. And in turn, when we compare the same sequen sequence, we see that C, C3, we see C3 and C4, we see that the gross energy produced is high in the case of non-till. In the case of corn, it's also accounted for by the, ta by the type of grain. So we can calculate greenhouse gases, a carbon equivalent per gigacalorie produced by each system. And you can see that in the non-till system, non-till systems are more efficient than traditional tillage. And if you include C4, where well, it's a high emission of greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases by hectare, eventually you have a good efficiency and they produce the same amount of gases per gross energy produced than the continuous system under non-till. The conventional tillage system produced emissions, geocalories of per gross energy, three times more than the non-till systems. This means that if we want to produce a hand, for example, if we want to produce 100 gigacalories of gross energy for e in each system, at the top we have the acreage we would need to produce that energy, and at the bottom the amount of gases that w would be produced. So. I'm telling you this because there is a discussion about intensification of the systems. And intensification very often produces more greenhouse gases per unit of service surface. But when you consider it by production, they are more efficient. So you may produce more with a li more limited acreage. So you produce, may produce more in the same land without moving into other areas without having to move into marginal plots or plots which may suffer from degradation. And finally, by way of conclusion, in Uruguay, as compared to conventional tillage, non-till systems may reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, especially due 
to their possibility of, of causing co uh, carbon sequestration, but this is related to the kind of sequence used. We should always think about the biomass that goes back to the soil. Non-till produces lower nitrous oxide emissions and uh, the nitrogen fertilize, fertilization is very important here. At one point there is a saturation of carbon and the stock will not increase. And then we'll have, if we want to mitigate further on, we have to reduce nitrous oxide emissions. And we should find the best strategies for this. And here nitrogen fertilization plays a key role. And we may also reduce global warming with non-till approaches because it produces less CO2. In our case, yields stay the same or increased as compared to conventional till systems. That's why non-till was widely adopted in Uruguay. It may also be more efficient in order to reduce greenhouse gases. And I'd like to mention this because this is one of our main the, it is one of the main goals of non-till and it's the reduction of soil losses caused by erosion. In our country this is one of the main causes that drive carbon loss and when we fo talk about gases we forget sometimes about other advantages of non-till that may help to increase food production while protecting the environment. Thank you very much for your attention. Le agradecemos a Lucía Salvo Álvarez por su presentación y ya Thank you for your presentation and now we will listen to the last presentation delivered by Ernesto Biliso. Bueno, buenas tardes. Quiero agradecer Good afternoon. Let me thank the organizing committee for the opportunity of coming and give you some of my ideas. Some of what I'm going to explain has been already explained by the other two speakers. So um, I will be less, uh, um, I will be talking about not so many new things. The name of my presentation is, and I let me say something first, I decided to speak Spanish, but the organizing committee asked me to present the slides in English. My talk is uh, G Greenhouse Gases Emissions and Mitigation in Agriculture. The conclusion of this presentation, I hope, is uh, to have a, an overview of how we can rank uh, different elements that contribute to, to mitigation. Let's look at the same problem from different perspectives all the slides were in black but well something happened and now they are white I believe that something important uh, that the four countries member of Mercosur are interested in is that we have to differentiate two ideas the idea of emissions inventory greenhouse gases I mean which is the dominant um, view and an alternative view which is carbon balance. It is the non-dominant view in the rural sector. At the same time, I believe that we should work on the promotion of science-based technologies to mitigate greenhouse gases emissions. The notion of a greenhouse uh, gases emissions inventory and the notion of carbon balance is the one I'm going to explain. 
what uh, what do we mean in our countries in the southern corn as estimates of uh, greenhouse gases emission inventories well the IPCC has developed a methodology to estimate emissions, which is quite good. It has been adjusted and it has been reviewed by a number of scientists, people who have been working on this uh, topic for many years, and they have come up with this uh, chart or this um, picture in the rural areas we have two sources nitrous oxide and methane as the two previous speakers mentioned these inventories are that inventories because they do not take into account carbon sequestration and we have enough land and enough biomass to give this more significance to carbon sequestration. In general, emissions are estimated based on the IPCC methodology, and there carbon sequestration is considered to be in balance, zero. And that's a very big simplification because it's not the same thing what land can sequester in Taiwan or Japan or what land can do in large countries with large amounts of biomass such as Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay or Paraguay. So we are looking just at one part of the problem and we are putting too much emphasis on estimating emissions and very little effort to cal in estimating carbon sequestration, which is not a good thing. So we have to consider that uh, emissions inventories today do not, is not a carbon balance or at least we may say it is a very imperfect carbon balance. If we consider historical emissions since 1880 to 2015, we will find that until 1940, 1950, things were split between energy sector industry and agriculture. Fifty percent was explained in the different land use and production systems. But ever since the 50s, the two curves start to get wide apart. And today, thanks to industrialization, urban development, increased population, we find that the energy sector residues and industry release much more carbon to the atmosphere than land use changes such as pastures, deforestation, etc., or agriculture production. A paper from last year shows that carbon sequestration is almost as important as emissions. This is a meta-analysis that shows that rural lands, though they do have emissions, they have a great capacity of sequestering carbon. So part of the carbon that is released are, is captured again, and carbon deactivates in the atmosphere, and part is captured by oceans. So you see that balance is quite uh, balanced, but still emissions are more than sequestration. It is approximately 10% more the emissions of the greenhouse gases deactivated by the atmosphere, the oceans, and the seas. 
this study shows that rural lands have a great capacity to sequester carbon to balance out the emissions. This uh, paper is something we are working on for GPP, which is the group of producing countries from the south, where we show the sources of greenhouse gases, and we see that deforestation, I'm being um, distracted by the microphone in the expo. This is about 16% in Mercosur that depends on deforestation and burning, 23% to enteric emissions, that is livestock emissions, basically beef and um, beef cattle and then 12% that corresponds to annual crops. This is very important in the times we are living. You must have heard many people talk about the G20, a group of developed countries and developing countries that have been meeting last year in Germany. The chair was Mrs. Merkel, and next year this group G20 will come to Argentina. The chairman will be President Macri, and the finance ministers suggested an agenda based on well, and this comes from one of the think tanks that analyze the issue. They suggest that they should penalize by applying taxes to carbon emissions. This money should go to a fund to be invested in infrastructure to mitigate the consequences of greenhouse gases. The main sectors on which those taxes would be imposed should be tele would be telecommunications, water and sanitation, transportation and energy. Agriculture is not mentioned. If countries such as Argentina, which has a high sequestration capacity but is not acknowledged for that capacity, and is, if it's only measured by its emissions, well, this system would be disadvantageous for us. It only helps countries that have no land, that have no biomass to sequester carbon and are, that have high emissions of greenhouse gases. So this is a threat, but also an opportunity because next year Argentina will host the G20 and this should be seriously mentioned by the four Mercosur countries so as to move the focus or think about this in a different way. When we talk about the average carbon sequestration values in annual crops, not all crops have the same sequestration potential. If we look at corn sequestration, carbon sequestration values, we would have three tons of carbon that are captured through photosynthesis in the aerial biomass and a little bit more in the underground biomass. The same happens with sorghum and wheat. And as we move to other crops, we can see that the biomass production capability drops. Have I run out of time already? Well, so when we look at the carbon flows in the production system, we find that carbon is sequestered, it goes to the roots, and it is recycled in three compartments, the above-ground biomass, the root 
biomass and organic matter. And it's a breakdown process and part of the carbon goes back into the goes into the atmosphere. This process is not well understood. And this is one of the reasons for which the IPCC is not developing or hasn't been able to develop a more a better system to calculate carbon balances. Well, we change the use of land. This is the case. This is a meta analysis that included the 185 trials. And it shows that when a forest is turned into arable land, it loses a given amount of carbon. The same happens when the forest is turned into grassland. And when the grassland is turned into crops, there is carbon losses, but the process is reversed when a grassland is turned into a forest, when a cropland is turned into grassland, or when a cropland is turned into a forest. This means that what happens be underground the sequestering capacity is not well understood and not fully assessed yet. I'm going to end my presentation at this point so as not to, so as not to take up more of your time, but I, my, message, my take home message would be this one. The main approach we are using to reach global agreements on mitigation policies is focusing on mitigation of greenhouse gases and it ignores the capability of carbon sequestration of rural or crop land. We should shift this vision, change it. Mercosur countries should focus on this and the dominating vision of the stock of emissions should be substituted by a more realistic approach that considers carbon balance, not only carbon emissions. The, today, the main driver for carbon balance in agroecosystem is the use of land. Changes in the use of land bring about changes in carbon production or sequestration. But all the factors should be ranked, should be considered. Non-till system, rotation, fertilization, which have, which are ranked in a different, which have different contributions to the general carbon balance and that may influence the final results related to the change of land use. We thank Mr. Vilito for his presentation and the moderator will share with us a wrap up of this panel. I will be very brief because it's already three o'clock and the next panel will start soon. These have been very interesting presentations. There is a lot of presentation but we are lacking behind as a region. There are dominating methodologies, as Enrico has that are imposing some conditions on us. There is a challenge related to food security. Mercosur is the only region in the world that may produce much more food. Lucia and Zhao have shown to us that we may produce more food with non-till systems, but we need to change environmental mindset, international mindset, so that Mercosur may meet the challenges of environmental security and food security. Thank you very much. So we thank the three speakers for their presentations.